hope you caught those last words. I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father except through him. So we didn't make that up. That's the Lord. If you don't know him today, I hope you, I hope, I hope, I hope you will accept him. And if not, come see me after church. I would love to talk to you. Today we're going to talk about one of our favorite topics in the whole world. I hope you're excited about it. If you're like me, you don't need this. Because you've got tons of patience. You've got tons of You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Preach it, sister. I like this. There is a daredevil raccoon who is on the loose. And this daredevil raccoon grew impatient for an easy meal. And what this raccoon did was it set out for what it thought was going to be the next easiest meal. Instead of it dropping in his lap, he was going to go looking for eggs. Bird eggs. True story. I'm not setting you up for a joke, okay? Y'all look at me like, uh-huh, where's this going? This is a true story. In fact, this raccoon kept animal lovers on edge earlier this year, and it made television news when it was spotted climbing a giant skyscraper in St. Paul, Minnesota. Here's a picture of it, if you don't believe me. And there's a little rocky raccoon. Yes, he is right there. He made it 80% of the way up this massive skyscraper before he was spotted. But something happened. About 80% of the way up the skyscraper, I think it dawned on him what he was doing, and he got stuck. You ever been like that? He got stuck 80% of the way up, but by this time, the helicopters were in the air, the news teams were around, the world was riveted to footage of this poor raccoon clinging to dear life on the side of a skyscraper. And as it froze and became stuck, the internet had a collective panic attack for this poor little trash panda. This poor little raccoon is just (laughs) sitting there But workers finally rescued this poor little guy. They came, and I think we have a photo of him. He got to the top window. Oh, there he is. Cute, cute little guy. Yes, he is. And when it reached the top, there was a a, a worker that released it to safety. And I kid you not, this next thing, this is a quote. It is true. A behavioral expert on raccoon behavior was interviewed, and he said this. Read along with me. He says, raccoons don't think ahead very much. So raccoons don't have very good impulse control. I don't think the raccoon realized when it started climbing quite what it was in for. You know, I got to looking at that quote this week, and I said, that sounds awfully familiar to us humans. In fact, I'm going to do something we've never done before. Why don't we take that quote, Ryan, swap out the word raccoon for humans, and let's read this together. Humans don't think ahead very much. So humans don't have very good impulse control. I don't think the human realized when it started climbing what it was in for. You ever been there? Oh, church, this is a real one for us today. This is not just some fluffy Bible lesson today. Get ready. All right, there's your warning. I'm not going to challenge you at the end like I usually do. I'm going to challenge you all the way through. I'm going to ask little questions like, how are you doing with that? What's up with that? Does this apply to you? Where are you in regards to this? Because today is for us. We are so prone to going headstrong into the day without exercising godly patience. People say patience is a virtue. No. Patience is a fruit. And it's a tough fruit sometimes to bear. A lot of us wish we would have more patience. Be careful when you pray that. Because there might be some opportunities coming your way for you to demonstrate that said patience. When we look at this poor raccoon, we are just like him. We go straight into the day. Maybe we plow ahead and we find ourselves trapped in in circumstances that were beyond our control. I get that. Maybe it's bad choices we've made that we're dealing with. Or maybe we feel trapped by sin. Fortunately, there's good news. There's always good news. You know that. Just like that, that poor little raccoon, that little trash panda, had someone who would rescue it, we have someone with a capital S who has rescued us from our sin. Because of that cruel cross and all that Jesus went through, and he patiently endured all that went on on that cross, he has rescued us from those chains of sin. He has rescued us from a lifestyle marred by impatience and strong-headedness, plowing ahead in our own feeble attempts. He has saved us. He He has broken those chains, and we are set free from our old life, and now we're free to walk in newness of life. We're free to walk because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. Then, and only then, can we bear rich fruit. Bearing fruit without the Holy Spirit in your life is a fruitless exercise. 
That's not one of your notes, but that should be. I just made that up. That is awesome. You need to write that down. See if I can remember it. Bearing fruit without the Holy Spirit in your life is a fruitless exercise. Because you know what you're doing? You're just trying to exercise sheer willpower. And you come to a traffic light wrong, and it is going to be sheer willpower. You can't do it. There is something out there that has your button that makes you. <laughs> you know, don't look at me like I'm the only one. I see there's no room for self righteous, just a potter's hand. You're safe here. We all fit in. We can all take the mask off. Nobody's perfect except Jesus. Only he has it all together. So today we're going to dive straight into Galatians chapter 5 and look at fruit. Go ahead and open your Bibles. Galatians chapter 5, if you're leading a digital app, pull up your favorite Bible app to the NLT translation, the New Living Translation. While you get that up, let me welcome our online campus. Any first-time visitors today, a special welcome to you. We pray God's Word will speak loud and clear to you. It's great to have you with us. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Let's read it together. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Ooh, that's deep. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit... You are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. What a list. That is incredible. Look, keep going. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ah, but. Here's a but. There's always the good news. Verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Here it is. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. Whew, that's powerful. That's powerful. I'm going to do something that I I seldom do. I want to read it again from a different translation, just the last part. I'm going to read from the message because it is so different and so out there. When I read it in a second, you'll know why we don't consult it very often, but you could benefit by using this in your own devotional time, your own quiet time. It's powerful. Listen to the way the message says, verse 19. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All-consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper. An impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes. Divided lives small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, Mm -mm, no comment there, uncontrolled or uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. Hey, this isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. I love how this is worded. If you use your freedom this way, mm -mm, mm -mm, you'll not inherit God's kingdom. But, here's the but, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, and serenity. Serenity. I love that word. It means peace. And the next one would be patience. Serenity. I love that, especially that, that, that word right there that we ended on, serenity. I don't know about you, but being a science fiction nerd... When I hear the word serenity, I immediately think of this. Is it just, yes, is it, anyone, just three of us? Okay, we're nerds, cool. Four, five, amen, God sees that hand. Serenity. Paul is saying to experience serenity, you must bear the fruit of patience. To exhibit the fruit of patience, we must walk by the Spirit. We must allow the Spirit to lead us. The Greek word used here is pneuma. 
Pneuma is a powerful word. It literally means to breathe or wind or even the Spirit of God. It's used over 240 times in the New Testament. But right here, it means something special. It's being used to say this. You want to display the fruit of the Spirit? And I hope you do. I know you do because you're here. You want to display the fruit of the Spirit? Guess what? Then you have to walk daily in the Spirit and renew yourself and be sanctified daily, allowing the Spirit of God to make you clean again and new and connecting with Him. I'm not saying getting saved every day. I'm not saying rededicate your life every day. I'm not talking about anything like bondage. I'm talking about connecting with the Father through the indwelling of the Spirit and saying, Lord, I need to bear these fruit today. Will you help me? Will you make a way? Because in my flesh, and I know my flesh, it is sad. Will you make a way where I don't see a way? Paul is saying this is the only way to avoid the desires of the flesh. In other words, the evidence of the Spirit's leading is the fruit of the Spirit. So if your kids were to come up to you to say, Mom, Dad, are you, are you led by the Spirit? They would have the answer right there on the other hand. And that is the fruit of the Spirit should be showing up in our lives. So let's begin challenge part one. How you doing with that? You read the long list of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self, gentleness, self, all those great things. How you doing with that? Let's just do a little introspection. Just you and, you and God. You're safe. I can't read your mind. Neither can your neighbor unless you look at him and give it away. This is just between you and him. How are you doing at work by displaying the fruit of the Spirit? Think about your board meetings. Think about that last phone call you had. Or maybe not. Maybe don't think about that one that you hung up on. How are you doing exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit like patience with your kids? Or maybe with your parents? How are you doing not only at work and at home, but at school or oh, in the car? <sighs> See, that's how you know we're all in this together because I reveal my weaknesses every week. That is my button. One of my study Bibles, as I was putting this together this week, defines patience as this, the quiet willingness to accept irritating or painful situations. Wow. <clears throat> Or, if that doesn't hit close enough to home, how about this? The quiet willingness to accept irritating people. <laughs> well, that definitely puts it in new perspective, doesn't it? I mean, come on. This is like spirituality 401 level, like graduate class. Can't we just go back to like spiritual pablum and just like do the 101 stuff? Because this, you ever prayed that prayer to the Lord? Where you're like, Lord, just give me patience. Like this right here, I, I love this. This is so perfect. Lord, just grant me patience. Because if you give me strength, I'm going to need bail money. I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> if you grant me strength, I'm going to snap this guy like a twig. Right? So what do we do? We say, you know, Lord, just, just give me patience. I'm serious. I Googled this. Within two seconds, this came up. This is such a great prayer. Bless me with patience. Not opportunities to be patient. Oh, no, no. I've got plenty of those, and they don't seem to be working. Lord, I want the actual patience. Just, just shortcut all the opportunities and take me to patient town, right? Because that's where we want to be. We want the shortcut. We want the easy route. But the evidence of the Spirit's leading is the fruit of the Spirit, and it says it's patient. What about if you're that grandfather, and you're just so excited, you're spending time with your grandson, you're having a great time, you got the concrete out, and you're fixing the sidewalk out front, you're not even charging the city, even though it's probably their responsibility and their thing, because they're taking a lot of your tax money, but you're sitting here, and you're, you're doing this, and you're going for hours, like 12 hours, and your grandson shows up, and all he wants to do is give you a hug, granddaddy. Patience. <laughs> Patience. If only we would heed the words of the great theologian, Axel Rose. All it takes is just a little patience. For the seven of you that understand what's happening here, it is the best day ever. By the way, if, if one of these isn't for you, just hang on. There's something for you, okay? There's something for every decade in every sermon, I promise. So we got little kids here. We got old people, everything, okay? There's a great book out called Made in His Image, 10 Ways that God calls us to reflect his character. It was written by Jen Wilkins, and one of her statements that just stepped me back in my tracks was this statement right here. Impatience results when we are bad at math. I think, oh, okay, that's good, because I hate math. Maybe that's it, but that's not what she's talking about. You know what she's talking about? 
Here's your alert. We're about to go real deep, real quick. She's talking about how we fail to count the cost for the choices we make in life. She's talking about how we fail to count the cost on a particular project that we started and we probably shouldn't have, or a particular situation, or a particular person that we've gotten tangled up with. We didn't stop and count the cost, as Scripture tells us, to count the cost to our time. We didn't count the cost to our wallets. Maybe we didn't even count the cost to our egos. And our patience ends up in the red. You ever come across a situation in life where you're looking at it, you're halfway in the middle of something, and you go, wait a minute. <laughs> this is taking a lot longer than I expected. It's patience. Or maybe you look at that situation and go, uh, yeah, th- this, is, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. I'm out. You probably had a, a temptation right there to exercise impatience and to, to bail on it. Because we're all bad at math when it comes to truly calculating the cost of things. Every one of us has areas in our lives where we misestimate the cost of something. Some of us are awesome at miscalculating. I mean, we're like great at it. It's almost like a spiritual gift. When we're young, we miscalculate. We think marriage is going to be the most easy thing. It's just going to give us constant loving bliss. And for just a minimal cost of 50% and 50%. Oh, no, no, no. Marriage is 100%, 100%. And nobody said it was easy. Unless you're married, of course, to Amy or something like I am. I'm, oh, it's easy. Right? Right? Isn't that good? When we're, when we're parenting, we give, we think, you know what? If I could just have children, that's going to give me deep meaning. And no expense. No expense needed. Oh, my goodness. Poor child. There's great expense with that. At work, we think, you know what? This is going to give me purpose without requiring much in return. We're terrible at calculating this, but once we look at the nature of commitment, we lose patience, and what do we do? We long for it to improve and terminate in the shortest time possible. Be honest, because we're bad at calculating the cost. We're bad at math. We're bad at counting the cost when it comes to trials, to relationships. We're bad at counting the cost when it comes to suffering especially us in America, because we're so blessed. We are so fat, happy, and content here that when suffering comes along, be honest, we don't know what to do with it. So we pray for the quickest route through it. We want the express lane, right? Lord, I know suffering, I've read somewhere in this book that it's supposed to be a good thing, but it's probably for somebody else. How about this little bypass? Can I have this express lane through it? Because that's what we want. We want to, the amount of time that God thinks is needed for us to complete our suffering, and the amount of time we think is not the same. Many times we miss it. We have such ridiculous short patience. If we can't be patient longer than it takes five seconds for a website to load, how in the world are we going to weather a storm in our life? Church, I'm talking to us. How in the world do we, only in Apex, can we be riding down the road and slam into a pothole and wreck our alignment and we yell out, fix the potholes already, and in the same light cycle, we come up to workers who are fixing potholes and we yell at them, move it already, what's taking so long? You can't have it both ways. What is wrong with us? This is, this is such an enigma to me. We get so easily angered and, and kindles this up. If we don't get what we want when we want it, woo. let's bring this even closer to home. Amazon Prime. Two words. See, a week, a week used to be enough time. Oh, you know, hey, yeah, you'll have it by Friday. Oh, sweet. Okay. It doesn't take eight months from China. Awesome. That's not fast enough. Four days. That's not fast enough, Pastor Matt. I want two days. No, 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 no. I want overnight. No, 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 no. I want a drone to fly it to my house by lunch. I want same-day shipping. And we're used to that. And we'll pay whatever it takes. Doesn't matter if the shipping is twice the cost of whatever gizmo you bought. Here's the problem. You ready for this? Hold your heads. Okay, get ready because this is a truth grenade. We can start putting those expectations on God. And when he doesn't jump to our tune that we play, we get mad at God. Awfully quiet here. <laughs> see, what, see what we've done? We have, we have 
transposed our expectations for the UPS and put it on the creator of all there is and said, God, I, I, I know what I want and I know when I need it. And if you just kind of follow my lead, I'll help you through this, O oh creator. Now, we don't say that with our lips, but we say that with our actions, right? When we say, God, why aren't you doing this? And, and we get angry with God. If he doesn't do things according to our timetable, we might even question his goodness. What are we doing? Shame on us. So I'm going to drop another truth grenade for you, okay? Are you ready for this? Think about something. Maybe you've never thought of this. What if it's the waiting itself that is the good and perfect gift that God's delivering to your doorstep? Wrap your head around that. What if that is the gift? What if it's the waiting? What if it's him saying, the whole child, you don't understand. If you go around that corner, there's a reckless car that needs to run out of gas before it runs you over. But if I let that light turn green when you wanted it to, Pastor Matt, you see what I'm saying? What if he is sparing me additional pain and additional stress in my life because his timeline is so far superior than my petty demands? You ever thought about that? What if the struggle or the hardship you're facing now is actually the setup for your victory, your next breakthrough? Think about that. How many people have ever heard of a guy named Lee Iacocca? Anybody remember Iacocca? Oh, my goodness. Here's a picture of him. Happy, jolly man. He used to work for Ford, but nobody knows him from Ford. You know why? Because Henry Ford Jr. and him went like this. And Henry Ford fired him because Lee Iacocca brought a great new idea to the table called the Ford Pinto. <laughs> if you laugh, you know what a Pinto is. And they were horribly cheap cars right up there with the Yugo. And they had slight malfunctions, like blowing up at stoplights, sitting there idling. You look at it wrong, it could burst into flames. It was one of those cars that, I mean, you couldn't give them away. And so they parted ways, and Iacocca was a disgrace. He was a defeat. So another car company said, hey, why don't you bring your other ideas over here? That was Chrysler. We know him as Mr. Chrysler. Turned the whole company around. People wanted him to run for president because he brought a different idea. Guess what he brought? The caravan. Because he didn't give up, because his bitterness and all the stuff that went wrong with him, because of all that could have gone wrong over here ended up being a delay, guess what he gave the world? He gave us all the minivan. Yes, the minivan. And if you drive one, you too used to be cool, just like us. Conflict, struggles, hardships, church, hear me, they don't have to be a bad thing. If we wait patiently and we respond to conflict, I tell you, here, here's, here's a truth for you. How you handle the conflict, you can either let it control you or you can give it to God and have him help you through this. In other words, patience is not the ability to wait, but it is how you act while you are waiting. I don't think I've ever quoted Joyce Meyer in my life, and I probably will never quote her again. But right here, she nails it. That is awesome. It's not the ability to wait. It's how you act, church, while you're waiting. And I am talking to myself because you're going to hear a story here in a minute that is so embarrassing, but it is so true. How we act. See, there's comedians out there who make a living by saying, you know what, you want to have a happy life? Here's the secret. Have low expectations. <laughs> Just don't expect much. But maybe it's not having low expectations. Maybe it's having right expectations. Look at Jesus. Jesus spent an incredible amount of time establishing right expectations for what it would cost to be his disciple. You want to follow me? It's not easy. I'm not promising you a happy, clappy life. In fact, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're probably not even worthy to be my disciple. You're not sold out to me. What? Who preaches discipleship like that? That's not a way, Jesus, to gain followers. You need to go to a marketing class. Don't you know better? That's what people would say today. Tell the Lord how to, unbelievable. He came and he redefined what it meant to be blessed, what it meant to be charitable. He came and he redefined all kinds of, of things, expectations about what it meant for the, the gospel to be presented and how people would respond. He said people are not going to be like, woo, yay, awesome, I'm a sinner. But it's true. And that's a word you can't even say today without people going, don't you judge me. <laughs> not judging you. Goodness. 
That's what God's Word tells us. He provided a way. I'm one beggar telling another where I found great free food. You want some? It's awesome. Come on in. Jesus shows up, and he, he uses parables. He talks about patience. And almost every one of them had to deal with harvest. We're in October, my favorite time of year. Woo, love the season. Here's the problem with harvest parables. We're so far removed from agrarian lifestyle, we can't grow nothing on our own. I tried. I tried growing cucumbers with my wife. We had this little plot of land, four foot by four foot square. I kid you not. We plant them. I'm like, this is hard. I'm sweating. And we plant it. All right, we'll water it, whatever. I come out the next day. I'm looking. Where's the cucumbers? Like, I'm wanting, I'm like, I'm disappointed. I, like, I kind of know it'll probably take, all right, I'll give it another day. Come out the next day. I'm like, where are the cucumbers? Nothing? Maybe even a little pickle? Is there nothing? This farming stuff takes time, and Jesus knew that. He showed up, and he's like, guys, it takes months for grain to sprout heads. It takes years for a vineyard to yield a vintage. And it takes decades for a mustard seed to grow into a tree. So why are you expecting everything overnight and to rewrite the laws of physics? He is saying, y'all, intense work is involved sometimes. He shows up and gives this incredible thing, and all we say is, this is taking longer than I expected. Lord, I'm impatient. You need to make that cucumber grow. So Jesus shows up, he uses these harvest images, and he talks about patience. Look with me at Luke 8, 15. He says this, as for the seed and the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with what? There's that word. James mentions it also in the context of a harvest. He says this, be what? Patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be what? Patient. The farmer's patient. You know why? Because he's good at counting the cost. He gets it. God is never impatient because he's good at counting the cost. He sees the end from the beginning, and he's got it all. He never looks at your life and says, oh, my goodness, the sin in your life. This is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> Wow, fixing you, that's going to be harder than I thought. Gabriel, Michael, gather around. What are we going to do about her? I'm so, I don't know what to do. God's not like that. You know why? Because he was willing to pay the cost. You know what the cost was to buy us back from our sinful lifestyle? The spotless lamb. It was Jesus. Jesus, the embodiment of patience of the Father. He was the one who was the actual revelation of the Father's patience. He is the perfect example for us. Think about this. By the time we complete our morning commute and we take a seat at the desk, we have probably committed the sin of impatience a dozen times. And by the time we come home, oh, the home commute, that's even worse. Just the other day, I'm sitting at the stoplight. I told you it's going to be a confession. And there's a van in front of me, and I am so ready for that van to go. And I see, and it's like, it's still green, now it's yellow. Just go, just go. And I accelerate, and they don't. I don't know what their problem was. Everybody knows the yellow light means go fast. So I pull up, like, mm! so I'm already on edge. Amy's with me. The kids are with me. I wish they weren't, but they were. I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, so my foot's tapping. I'm like, oh, I got to watch a whole other light. Don't they know we've got places to go, things to do? And I'm so jazzed up and impatient. Amy reaches over, and she, as she does, she just calms, just rubs my arm. Peace, brother. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm, I'm the kind of guy, not only am I looking at my light, I'm looking at the lights on the other streets to see when they're going to, right? Anybody with me? Yes? Amen. I see that hand. God bless you. I'm looking at these lights. I'm like, okay, it's turning yellow. Here we go. Here we go. I'm off the brake. I've got my foot in the air. As it turns green, I'm hitting the gas. And she doesn't. Thank you. She doesn't. And I'm so, I'm like, zzz, zzz, zzz. and immediately I hit the brake, and my hand goes over the horn. And I'm so ready. I am so ready to hit the, I'm like, just go. Just go. It's green. Go. Go. Is everybody seeing this? What is her problem? Go. We're going to miss this light cycle again. If she doesn't go, and then I couldn't help it. I'm so sorry. Come on, just go. And then it turns yellow. 
No, she doesn't go, thankfully. I would have been, uh, I would not be your pastor. She stops, pulls like two feet ahead, and it turns red, and I look at Amy. And then it happened. At first, it was very quiet, very, very silent, just almost imperceptible, and then it grew louder and louder and louder. And I heard what she had heard, the sirens coming of ambulances and fire trucks heading to rescue somebody who was in critical need. It gets worse. Besides the fact that I got kids in the car and a pH magnet on the back of my truck. <laughs> right? no, two, two on the back. The lady pulls to the side into the turn lane now and leaves that open space in front. And I have no choice but to slowly pull up beside her And as I look over, I kid you not, she, with the patience of Job, looks over. <laughs> Do you know how small I felt in that moment? I wanted to crawl under my steering wheel. I couldn't wait for that light to turn green now. Because she had me. I was acting like a jerk. Because I had no patience. We deal with people all the time. We rub shoulders with people who get on our nerves. Jesus did too. Guess what? Out of the whole Bible, the whole New Testament about him, you know he rubbed elbows with people who got on his nerves. People who he saw transgressing his father's commands constantly. He's like, duh, duh, duh. you know how many times he even got righteously indignant? Out of the whole, out of 33 years. Two. Two times in 33 years. We get angry two times in 33 minutes. And we're probably not justified. He was justified. It was righteous indignation. And he never sinned. This was holy anger. He had every right. Even when his family came to him and said, man, you got to speed things up. you got to get things going. He said, my time has not yet come because he was waiting patiently on his heavenly father's timeline. So i got to ask, how you doing with that? As you go through your work week this week, May we reflect a difference in Christ. May we show this patient. The apostle Peter witnessed all of Jesus' suffering. He said this. He said, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He didn't retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Paul comes along and he puts it this way in 1 Timothy. He says, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of what great patience with even the worst of sinners Jesus had with me. The, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. There it is. So that you can believe in him and have eternal life. You want to bear fruit? It starts with a relationship with Christ. You can't bear fruit of Christ without knowing him. It is impossible. Paul knew that the depth of his sin displayed the depth of Christ's patience because he didn't give up on him. Are you glad Christ hadn't given up on you? Are you? Man, I am. I'm so glad he's got a second chances and third chances and 50,000 chances. It doesn't zap me when I lay on my horn. I wouldn't be here very often. I'd be singed all the time with little lightning bolt strikes. I'm so glad God didn't give up on us. There's a famous story of a believer who was seriously ill. And he, he knew he was dying, and he went to visit his family doctor. His family doctor had one of those country practices out where the top floor is the ground level that you see, and that's where the business is, and he sees his patients. But he lived downstairs in a residence that you really couldn't see. And that patient, who was gravely ill and knew he was dying, went and talked to his doctor one last time, and he says, what do you think it's going to be like? when I cross this border and I go be with the Lord soon. The Christian doctor took off his stethoscope. He says, 
And before he could answer his question, they both heard a sound. And it was a scratching sound on the door. He said, that's it. He looked at his patient. He said, do you hear that scratching sound? You know what that is? He said, that is my dog. I left him downstairs, but he has grown impatient. He doesn't have a clue what's in here, but he hears my voice. He doesn't know. He's never been in this room, but he knows his master is here. He has no grasp what's inside, but he knows that I'm here, and to him, that is all that matters. He just wants to be with his master. And he looked at his patient. And he says, isn't it the same way with you? You may not know what all lies ahead, but you know your master's there. Probably some loved ones are already there. And that's all that matters. You don't grasp what's beyond death's door. You know your master's there, and that is assurance enough. Puts it in a whole different perspective. When we go through these days, Lord, give us patience to pull back again and see this heavenly perspective that you see, to know the trials and the sufferings and the people who just can't drive are loved by you. It is all worth it, life's trials and temptations. So today, we're going to pray for patience, that we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you again for the power of your word and the simplicity of the truth of the gospel. And Lord, we confess that we need patience. And while it scares me to pray publicly that you would increase our patience, Lord, I pray that you would grow us, that we would be more like Jesus, that we would find ourselves showing the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. May people see you when they see us. Forgive us for the times we've blown it. Thank you for a second chance again. Restore us, Lord. Give us strength. Help us to, to live as Christ, to have the mind of Christ this week. We love you. We pray in your powerful name. Amen.